All right, welcome to episode two of the Hardware VGA project. So the main topic for this video will be video memory and interfacing the video memory to the host system. But before we cover that, I want to address some feedback that viewers left on the first video. And then I want to talk about a few hardware changes that I've made since the first video. And then I will talk about the PCB space budget. Basically, will all of the components that we need fit on one of the nine by 15 centimeter cards that I'm using in the 8-bit system? All right, let's get started. All right, so just for context, the project I'm talking about here is I am building a VGA text display using dual port static RAM, 74 ACT logic chips, and GAL devices. All right, so there were a couple comments that pointed out that it would really make a lot of sense to use an FPGA for a display controller. And one thing I want to emphasize is I completely agree, it would make a lot more sense. So basically all that's really happened here is that I tried to get a version of this display controller working using an FPGA for a very long time and got burned out on it. Whereas the current effort is making excellent progress and I'm having a lot of fun and I do feel reasonably confident I will get it to work. So anyway, I'm definitely planning to revisit FPGAs in the future. And one of the things that my current experience has really sold me on is the idea that using a digital logic simulator to prove a design before attempting to implement it is enormously useful. So I think in the future, if I can learn how to use digital logic simulation to try out uh, FPGA designs and simulation before actually trying to implement them in a circuit, I think that's going to potentially finally make me productive with FPGAs. So that will come at some point, but for now I'm having fun doing this project the wrong way. Another comment on the first video suggested that it would maybe make more sense to use a digital video output, HDMI, DVI, etc., rather than analog VGA. And I, I, again, I don't disagree with you that that would make a lot of sense. It's just that I happen to know VGA. And in general, to get this project to work at all, I'm really trying to aggressively reduce the unknowns and risks so that I can hopefully get to a working product uh, at the end. But again, as with FPGAs, this is something that I probably will investigate in the future. All right, so let's talk about the hardware changes. So this is the original output circuit, and its job is to take the foreground color, background color, and pixel value that are coming from the pixel generation hardware and choose one of the colors, the foreground or the background, depending on the pixel value. That is done by a 74ACT157 quad to one multiplexer. So the other problem that the output module solves is that there is a visibility signal active low that indicates whether the pixel color that is chosen by the first multiplexer should either be passed through to the output register or set to zero if the visibility signal is not asserted. So a viewer on the first video very helpfully pointed out that the 74ACT157 has an enable input. And you'll see that on both of these multiplexers, the enable input is tied to ground, meaning that it is continuously asserted. However, all we would really need to do here is hook up the visibility signal to the enable input of the first multiplexer. That would completely eliminate the need for the second one. So this chip is not really necessary. So here is the revised circuit. Visibility feeds into the enable input of the first multiplexer. Second multiplexer is gone. And I have gone ahead and implemented that change on the actual circuit board. And rather than removing the IC socket for the eliminated multiplexer, I just wired through the appropriate pins to pass the RGB and intensity signals on to the output register. So this all works well. So uh, very much appreciated to the viewer who left that comment. The second hardware change has to do with the way that the horizontal count and vertical count modules interact with each other. So in the original design shown here, the horizontal count module produces this H count end signal that is asserted when the horizontal counter reaches its terminal value, basically at the end of a scan line. That signal gets fed into the vertical count module, which was used for two purposes. One, to increment the vertical count, and secondly, to potentially update the visibility information about whether or not we were in the vertical visible part of a frame. So what I realized is I actually want to increment the vertical count before the end of the scan line. So rather than just relying on the H count end signal to know when to increment the V count, I'm going to need a separate input 
for that signal and I'll need to produce it in a slightly different way from the horizontal count module. I'll talk more about the motivation for making this change in the next video. But for now, let's just talk about the small hardware changes that are going to be needed. All right, so this is the current hardware design and I added a vcount inker input to the vertical count module to tell it when to increment the vertical count. That's driven by the H end pulse signal that is generated by the horizontal count module. So essentially at the end of the horizontal sync pulse, that's when the vertical count gets incremented. So I have gone ahead and made these changes. There were some very minor changes to the gal equations for the vertical count module. And as I mentioned, this will make more sense when we talk about the way that pixels are generated in the next video. Okay, so I believe at this point I do have a more or less finalized hardware design, meaning that I know what components I need on the board. So here's a spreadsheet I made that enumerates all of the parts, how many there are, the more or less accurate dimensions of each part on the actual board. And what I've found is that it looks like it's going to take about 78 square centimeters to fit all of the parts that will need to be on the board. And I have 135 square centimeters on the board itself. So it will be a bit crowded, but I think that there is a reasonable chance that everything will fit. So assuming I get all of the prototype hardware working, then the next step will be to design and build a PCB that will allow for a permanent installation of the display controller in the 8-bit system. Now let's take a look at the VRAM module. The main idea of the VRAM module is that the dual port static RAM works more or less the same way as normal asynchronous single port static RAM. The only difference is that there are two independent interfaces to the memory, consisting of an address bus, data bus, and control signals, chip select, read write, and output enable. One interface is used by the host system, the other by the display controller. The VRAM module has four ICs. There are two IDT7134 dual port static RAM chips serving as the lower 4 kilobytes and upper 4 kilobytes of the video memory. A 74ACT574 8-bit register, which is writable by the host system, selects which of the four 2KB banks of VRAM the host can access, and also selects a font from the font ROM. A GAL22V10 generates control signals for the dual port RAM and the bank register. The VRAM module has three general categories of signals. The host interface signals include the host address bus, host data bus, and host control signals. The rasterizer signals include the readout address and readout data. Finally, there are signals generated by the GAL, mostly control signals for the static RAM and bank register, and signals generated by the bank register. The theory of operation of the VRAM module is fairly straightforward. On the host side, the VRAM just looks like 2 kilobytes of memory in the window 8800 hex to 8FFF hex. Writing to the bank register, which is mapped at address 80E0 hex, chooses which 2 kilobyte VRAM bank the host can access. The upper four bits of the bank register are used to select a font from the font ROM. The GAL uses the upper five bits of the host address to determine when the VRAM window is being accessed. It uses the host read and write strobes to determine whether an access is a read or a write. Based on this information and the bank A12 signal which determines which VRAM chip is being accessed, the GAL generates control signals, read write, chip select, output enable, as appropriate. On the display controller side, the VRAM interface is even simpler. The read write input is tied to VCC, meaning that data is always read from the VRAM, never written. This makes sense because only the host system should ever write data to VRAM. The readout A12 signal and its inversion generated by the GAL is used to select one of the two dual port RAM chips. The readout addresses are generated by the readout module to be covered in the next video. Based on the readout address, one of the VRAM chips will assert a data value onto the readout data bus. This is the mechanism that the pixel generator will use to render pixels based on character and attribute data in the VRAM. Okay, so here's the actual prototype of the VRAM module, and conceptually it's not that complicated, it's only four chips. The challenging thing is actually all of the connections that need to go both to the ICs and the host system, which is these pin headers here, and the display controller, which is this pin header here. So what took a long time with this module was not really the technical design, it was the physical construction with all of the parallel bus wires that needed to be wired between the connectors and the ICs. So what made it actually work is I ordered some wire from a vendor on AliExpress that's 
really wire wrap wire except a little thicker than normal wire wrap wire and that turned out to be you know pretty much exactly what I needed to get this wiring done so I, I kind of enjoyed the point to point soldering so I had fun making this but it really did take quite a long time. All right so let me show you this hooked up to the 6809 system and we'll see if it actually works. All right, so here is our test setup. So let me see if I can explain what you're seeing here. This is the display controller prototype. This is the carrier board. Only the VRAM module is actually plugged in right now because that's all we want to test. These two connectors on the VRAM module are the ones that connect the VRAM module to the host system. And I have ribbon cables that go to this adapter board that I made that plugs directly into the backplane and brings out just the backplane signals that the VRAM module needs for the host interface side and could basically connects the VRAM module to the host system. Okay, so basically all I really want to know is can the host system access the VRAM using the bank register and does it see a 2K window of the VRAM in whichever bank is selected? So I have written a test program and what it does is it just fills each two kilobyte bank of the VRAM with a particular pattern of bytes and then reads them back. So pretty simple test, but if it works, it should give us a pretty good degree Degree of confidence that the host system can talk to the VRAM and both read data from the VRAM and write data to the VRAM. All right, so let's go ahead and run our test program. So in the terminal program here, I'll execute the D command to download a program to the 6809 system. So VRAM test.ahx, that's the Intel hex file that contains the assembled test program. So we'll load that into the host system memory. So it'll take a moment to download. All right, so the test program, the entry point is at address 1000 hex. So we'll set the monitor address to that address. And so now the S command will invoke the entry point as a subroutine. And there's the program executing and everything worked great. So these messages, the test program is telling us that it wrote a pattern of bytes into each of the four banks of the VRAM and these messages are telling us that it successfully read all of that data back from each of those four banks. So this gives us pretty good confidence that whatever data that the host system wants to put into the VRAM really is getting into the VRAM and will be accessible to the display controller in order to actually generate a text display. So uh, yes, as far as I'm concerned, this is pretty much working and we're ready to proceed with the rest of the controller. All right, so in conclusion, the VRAM module does seem to work, at least from the host side. And as always, the full schematics, code, GAL equations, etc., are in a GitHub repo that's linked from the video description. So in the next video, I will work on the readout module, and that is the module that generates the addresses of characters and attributes that will be fetched from VRAM in order to actually generate a text display. All right, so hope you enjoyed this, and I will see you in the next video.